This talk is about one of the most fascinating numbers in mathematics, the golden ratio, often denoted by the Greek letter phi. But what is the golden ratio, and what properties does it have? We'll also meet the Fibonacci numbers, but what are these, and how are they related to the golden ratio? And how are these topics related to art and nature? The number phi is the positive solution of the quadratic equation x squared equals x plus 1, and is one half of 1 plus the square root of 5, or 1.618033, etc., an irrational number which goes on forever. Although some of its geometrical properties can be traced back to ancient Greece, its description as golden did not emerge until the 19th century. In 1509, the Italian Luca Pacioli ascribed religious significance to it, calling it the divine proportion. And a century later, the mathematician and astronomer Johannes Kepler agreed, describing it as a precious jewel and claiming it to be elemental to God's creation of the universe. Because phi squared equals phi plus 1, we obtain its square by adding 1. So phi squared is 2.618, etc. If we then divide the quadratic equation by phi and rearrange it, we get 1 over phi equals phi minus 1. And so we obtain its reciprocal 1 over phi by subtracting 1. So 1 over phi is 0 0.618, etc. Also turning this last equation upside down, we find that phi equals 1 over phi minus 1. That is, 1.618 equals 1 over 0 0.618 and we'll need this last result shortly. As we'll see, much of the interest in the golden ratio arises from geometry, but assertions about its geometrical origins are often ill-founded. For example, claims have been made that the proportions of the Parthenon in Athens and other Greek buildings were based on it. Aesthetically, some buildings may seem too short and fat or too long and thin, as shown on the right while a rectangular building with proportions in golden ratio may be considered to have the perfect shape. But although the Greeks knew about the golden ratio, there's no evidence that they designed their buildings to accord with it. A golden rectangle is a rectangle whose side lengths are in the ratio of phi to 1. Above, on the left, is such a rectangle with sides phi and 1. And if we now remove the left-hand square with side 1, we're left with a vertical rectangle whose sides are 1 and phi minus 1. Now this smaller rectangle has the same shape as the original one. And to see why, we recall from our earlier result shown here that phi over 1, the ratio of the side lengths of the original rectangle, is the same as 1 over phi minus 1, the ratio for the second rectangle. If we now remove a square from the second rectangle and then a square from the third rectangle and continue in this way, we produce the pattern of rectangles above on the right. Here, the resulting rectangles, while getting smaller and smaller, all have the same shape. On this picture, we can then draw a succession of circular arcs that approximate a spiral pattern known as the golden spiral. As shown below, this spiral converges to a point. In fact, it's the point where diagonals of the first two rectangles cross, and is 0.618 of the way between the top and bottom of the rectangle, and 0.618 of the way between the two sides. And it's also a point where some artists, consciously or unconsciously, have placed the main focal point of their paintings to which the eye is naturally directed. Such a spiral is called a logarithmic spiral, and it arises in nature in the form of a nautilus shell, as shown on the right. It also appears in whirlpools, in the head of a sunflower, as we'll see later, and in other places also. So the golden ratio features in both art and nature. Indeed, the golden ratio arises throughout geometry. 
For example, in a regular pentagon, the length of any of its diagonals is five times the length of any of its five sides. Then, as shown on the right, an isosceles triangle formed from two sides of the pentagon and one diagonal has an angle of 108 degrees and two angles of 36 degrees. While a triangle formed from one side of the pentagon and two diagonals has one angle of 36 degrees and two angles of 72 degrees. Moreover, the number phi turns out to be twice the cosine of 36 degrees. By combining these triangles in two different ways, the Oxford professor and Nobel Prize winner Sir Roger Penrose constructed the two shapes below, known as the kite and the dart, to which we'll turn in a moment. Suppose that you wish to tile the floor of your bathroom with tiles that are all identical regular polygons. This can be done, but only in three ways. One is the familiar tiling made from squares, but there are also tilings with equilateral triangles and with a honeycomb pattern of regular hexagons. All three of these tilings can be extended as far as we like and look the same everywhere. In the 1970s, Roger Penrose constructed a different type of tiling, and on the right you can see him standing on a version of it. Using his kite and dart patterns, he produced what is now known as a Penrose tiling, as shown in the centre. These tilings are interesting in that, unlike the regular floor patterns shown above, they never repeat anywhere, however far out we go. They're also important scientifically, in that they turn up in the form of quasi-crystals, solids used in the construction of many practical items, such as LED lights and non-stick frying pans. Closely related to the golden ratio is the Fibonacci sequence of numbers. This is a sequence beginning with 1, 1, 2, 3, in which each successive number is the sum of the previous two. For example, 13 is 8 plus 5, and further on, 144 is 89 plus 55. Born around the year 1170, Leonardo of Pisa has been known as Fibonacci since the 19th century. While travelling in Africa, he learnt about our Hindu-Arabic numerals, which he then publicised in Western Europe in his influential Liba Abaki, or Book of Calculation. Here, in this early manuscript, you can see the Fibonacci numbers in a vertical column on the right. But in fact, these numbers predate Fibonacci by a long way, having arisen earlier in the context of Indian poetry, where mathematicians would count the rhythms with a given number of beats, short or long, obtaining these numbers as their results. Fibonacci's book contained many arithmetical problems, including his famous one about rabbits. A farmer has a pair of baby rabbits. Rabbits take two months to achieve maturity, and then give birth to another pair each month. How many pairs of rabbits are there after a year? For the first two months, there's just the original pair. But in month three, a new pair arrives, giving two in total. In month four, the original pair produces another pair, but the new pair hasn't yet produced, so there are three pairs, and so on. And as you can see, the numbers of pairs after successive months are the Fibonacci numbers. In fact, it's as easy as 1, 1, 2, 3. Interestingly, Fibonacci seems to have had no particular interest in this problem, and it didn't become popular until the 19th century. But what has all this to do with the golden ratio? In the early 17th century, Kepler considered the ratios of successive Fibonacci numbers and these ratios appear here in two columns, 1 over 1, 2 over 1, 3 over 2, 5 over 3, and so on. And as he discovered, and as you can see, the ratios in the left-hand column gradually increase towards the golden number. 
while those on the right decrease towards it, with their common limiting value being phi. Here we see how the Fibonacci numbers can be arranged in a spiral pattern that resembles our earlier golden spiral. Here, starting from the middle, are squares with sides 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8 and 13, and further ones can then be added at will. Also, like the golden ratio, Fibonacci numbers appear throughout nature. For example, the numbers of seeds in the spiral patterns of a sunflower head are often Fibonacci numbers, such as 34, 55 or 89. An amusing paradox popular in the 19th century was described by Lewis Carroll, mathematics teacher and author of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Here, an 8x8 grid of 64 squares is cut into four pieces, which are then rearranged to give a 5 by 13 rectangular grid of 65 squares. So where does the extra square come from? The paradox arises because when we form the 5 by 13 rectangle on the right, from the four pieces of the 8 by 8 square, there's a very narrow parallelogram in the center whose area is that of one small square. And in a similar way, we can cut and reassemble a 13 by 13 grid of 169 squares to give an 8 by 21 grid of 168 squares. But in this case, a square is destroyed rather than created. Before, we had 5 times 13 minus 8 squared is plus 1, and now we have 8 times 21 minus 13 squared is minus 1. But we notice that all these numbers, 5, 8, 13 and 21, are Fibonacci numbers. And for all similar examples, a single square is either added or destroyed. Below you can see Lewis Carroll's own drawings for generating the general case, together with a table which shows the Fibonacci numbers that arise. I'd like to conclude with an unexpected feature of the Fibonacci number 89. The decimal form of its reciprocal, 1 over 89, begins with 0.011235. Clearly exhibiting the early Fibonacci numbers. Indeed, 1 over 89 is exactly equal to the infinite sum of numbers shown in the middle, where the Fibonacci numbers appear after lots of zeros, or below in fractional form as 1 over 10 squared plus 1 over 10 cubed plus 2 over 10 to the fourth plus 3 over 10 to the fifth, and so on. And with that truly remarkable result, I'd like to thank you for listening.